if the bad things you did disqualifies you from receiving God's goodness, then his goodness is partial. Then it is no longer unmerited. If the only way you can receive something good from God is if you are good, then again, his goodness is merited. It is something you earn. But God's love for you, his goodness is unmerited. It is unearned. He will bless you. He'll be good to you because first of all, he loves you and he is good. Well, once again, good morning, everybody. Welcome once again to Kingdom Rock Family Worship Center. We want to welcome our online community that are gathering from all around the world. Thank you so very much for taking the time to join us in today's service. We know that the Father has a rich and wonderful word, relevant word, relevant and wonderful, that's going to really bless you today. If you haven't had the time to go to our website at kingdomrock.org, kingdomrock.org, then make sure you do so. And you can give your best gift today by clicking the Give button. And we so appreciate you for giving and supporting the ministry. It's because of people like you that help us to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we say thank you. Hallelujah. Kingdom Rock, let's thank our online community. Hallelujah. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. And gals. All right. All right. Let's go into part seven of the series entitled... Tell hell no. Now, the last time we were here, we were talking about inheritance, and we're going to continue to talk about inheritance today. Remember, our inheritance is, is a gift that we receive from God, an irrevocable gift, something that cannot be reversed, something that cannot be taken back once it is received. God's given you a gift, an irrevocable gift. Right now, once you've received the inheritance, of course, uh, it cannot be taken back. This inheritance comes from God. He has granted it to you as his child. If you are born of God, born again, you have an inheritance. As a matter of fact, you are inheriting with Christ. Now, in this series, we've been talking about uh, telling hell no, telling the devil no. Because we know that the enemy is trying his best to disrupt your supply line. He's trying to disrupt your in, disrupt you or hinder you from receiving all that God has for you. Now, the work has already been done. That's the thing. The work has already been done. The Father says that he's already blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. The work has already been done. But the enemy tries to deceive you into thinking that what God gave you is worthless or that it's not working for you. Or maybe you should just stop and just give up. Uh, we were watching, my wife and I were watching a movie uh, one particular uh, time. And uh, this, there was a court, courtroom scene. And in this courtroom scene, uh, there was a, a long, grueling trial. And right when uh, the case was about to be over and the battle was about to be won, the plaintiff, I believe, uh, held her hand up and say, I withdraw my claim. She said, I withdraw my claim or something like that. I, I, I withdraw it. The judge said, what? Now, billions of dollars were at stake here, but she wanted to stand on her principles. Okay. So she said, I withdraw my claim. Everything was done. Everything was done. All the lawyers had argued. Um, the attorneys had deliberated. I mean, all of that stuff was already done, was already finished. It was done. But she stopped the proceedings and lost it all. How many times, and I wonder how many times when we're about to actually win, we're actually, your prayers are about to be answered. Things are about to happen. Do we raise our hands and say, I can't take this anymore? And we just stop. The enemy wants, does not want you to receive your inheritance. He does not want you to take possession of it. He does not want you to use it or utilize it. 
So he's doing his very best to stop you, to hold you back from it. Now, the, the enemy is afraid, again, because once you begin to flow in your inheritance, you cannot be stopped. Let me say that again. Once you begin to operate in the things that God has given to you, you cannot be stopped. You are unstoppable once you begin to flow. That is, once you're standing on the firm foundation of Christ, you cannot be stopped. The gates of hell may come against you, but they will never overcome you. They will never overwhelm you. You cannot be stopped. The only way the enemy can stop you is by forcing you or trying to trick you to step off of that foundation. Now, let me give you another story. This will also help bring these things, uh, make, make it very clear to you. There's a young man who uh, wanted to be saved. He, he wanted to give his life to the Lord, but just didn't know how to do it. So he goes up to this pastor and says, Pastor, um, I want to be saved. I want to come to Jesus, but do I have to stop uh, smoking this marijuana in order to do it? The pastor said, no, no. He said, you don't understand, Pastor. You don't understand. He said, do, I want to come to Jesus. I want to be saved, but, but do I have to stop doing this Mary Jane, this blunt? Do I have to stop doing that first? The pastor again says, no. The gentleman says, I, I don't understand. The pastor says, Yes, I know you don't understand. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever cleaned yourself up before you got in the shower? There's, no, because the shower is where I go to get cleaned up. He said, let Jesus be your shower. Get into Christ. Get into him and let him clean you up. And then you're clean spiritually. Then you and Jesus will walk together and clean up this mind, clean up, clean up your soul. But you can't do the work by yourself. You don't clean yourself before you get in the shower. You don't say, I can't go to the emergency room because I'm bleeding. That's the craziest thing. You know, you go because you are. All right. So this talks about foundation. Now, um, salvation is not a work of your own. Let's go to Ephesians. Let's go ahead and go here. Ephesians 2nd chapter, Ephesians 2, verses 8, and 8, 9, and 10. We're going to talk about this foundation. Say with me, God is good. Amen. Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 8, 9, and 10 read like this out of the New Living Translation. God saved you by his grace when you believed. God saved you by his grace when you believe. Say with me, I am saved by grace. All right, so again, God saved you by his grace when you believe. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is a gift from God. Verse 9, salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Verse 10, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Now, God saved you because, he's, because he is loved, because God loves you. God saved you because he loved you and because he alone is good. Let me say that again. God saved you because he loves you and because he alone is good. One more time, God saved you because he loves you and because he alone is good. Let's go to Mark, Mark 10, verse 18, Mark 10, verse 18. Let's look at this, Mark 10, verse 18. And it reads like this. And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? For there is none good but one that is God. 
Jesus has a discussion with the young rich ruler. We know this, and the Lord breaks this down here. The only one that is good is God. God alone is good. Again, God saved you because he loves you and because he alone is good. His goodness far surpasses or far outweighs your sin. Now, these are foundational things that you have to know, have to get down pat. His goodness far surpasses or outweighs your sin. You should always expect to receive God's goodness in your life. Always expect to see God's goodness in your life. God provides his goodness for you because of his righteousness and not because of your works. God's goodness is given to you based on his righteousness and not your works. You should always expect, I'm going to say this again, you should always expect to see God's goodness. Let's look at the Amplified Bible. Let's look at Amplified, or rather uh, Psalm 27. Let's look at Psalm 27, verse 13 and 14. Now, here in the, in the church here, we can leave the scriptures up on the screen, okay? You don't worry about putting me on the big monitors at this moment. Just um, leave the scriptures up so everybody can see them. Psalm 27, look at 13 and 14. Uh, the Amplified Bible. It says, I would have, I would have uh, despaired. King James says fainted. I would have fainted. I would have despaired had I not believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Verse 14, wait for and confidently expect the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, Wait for and confidently expect the Lord. Let me say again, you should always expect to receive God's goodness. You should always expect to see God's goodness. As a matter of fact, his goodness is following you right now. His goodness is pursuing you right now. Let's go to Psalm 23. Psalm 23, verse number six, you know this verse. It says what? Surely goodness and mercy shall what? Follow me. How many days of your life? All the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Notice that God's goodness is following you. The word follow there means to pursue. It's coming after you. How many days of your life? All the days of your life. When things are going what we call well, when things are going not so well. All the days of your life, even today, the goodness of God and the kindness, the mercy or the kindness of God is pursuing you. The goodness and mercy of God are tracking you down. Every single day, every single day, you should expect God's goodness. Now, here's the thing. You can't outrun God. So when the Lord pursues you, he going to catch you. I get the picture of a two year old of a toddler and mama, mama, dad is running behind the little toddler. The toddlers. <laughs> yeah. I, I, one step. I got you. <laughs> You're not going to outrun God. You got what I'm saying to you? So when the Lord says he's pursuing you, he's coming after you, he's there. So this is why you should always expect the goodness of the Lord. When things are going terrible at work, when things are going terrible at home, expect the goodness of the Lord. Expect the goodness of the Lord. You can say, God, I thank you for being good to me right now. I thank you you being good to me right now because you are good. I expect to receive your goodness. Remember, David said again, I would have fainted unless I had seen the goodness, unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. The goodness of the Lord encourages you when you expect to see his goodness. It encourages you and strengthens you. Meditate on God's goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Look at Romans. Look at Romans, the second chapter, Romans 2, verses 3 through 4. And it says this. And do you think this, O man, 
you who judge those practicing such things and do the same, that you will escape the judgment of God, verse 4, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering? Look at this next phrase. Not knowing that the what? The goodness of God leads you to repentance. The goodness of God always goes before the sin. It goes before the sinner. Now, here is the, here is the fallen mindset. The fallen mindset says, if I do good things, I should expect to receive good from God. But if I do bad things, I should expect to receive bad from God. But notice how the goodness of God goes before the individual. You will receive good before you have done good. You will receive good before you have done good. Now that messes some minds up, but that's called the mind of Christ. Now listen, um, the sinner, again, the, the fallen mindset says, if I do bad, I should expect to receive bad. But if I do good, I should expect to receive good. You don't have to wait to receive good from God or expect to receive good from God when you've done, only when you've done something that is good. God's goodness, his unmerited favor in your life is not dependent upon your actions. He will bless you simply because he loves you and he is good. As a matter of fact, let's look at Romans 5. Romans 5, verse number 8. Romans 5, verse number 8 says this. But God demonstrates his love, his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So your goodness, let's get this down pat. Your goodness does not qualify you to receive God's goodness. Or should I say the good things you do does not qualify you to receive God's goodness. Neither does your bad or your evil or your sin disqualify you from receiving his goodness. If the bad things you did disqualifies you from receiving God's goodness, then his goodness is partial then it is no longer unmerited. If the only way you can receive something good from God is if you are good, then again, his goodness is merited. It is something you earn. But God's love for you, his goodness is unmerited. It is unearned. He will bless you. He'll be good to you because, first of all, he loves you and he is good. He alone is good. He is filled with goodness. His goodness flows like a river, like an unending river, an unending stream to his people. But we are the ones who get tied up in works, tied up in religion, and we say that God's not blessing us. Or we say God is going to bless me because I've done good. We try to qualify or disqualify ourselves based on our own actions. When the goodness of God has nothing to do with your performance. Are you hearing? Oh, yes. Your goodness never, your goodness or the good things you do never puts God in your debt. It never, you never put God in your debt when you do something good. In other words, God will never owe you a favor because you've done something good. He'll never owe you a favor. Never should you say, Lord, I know this week I haven't cussed. I, I, I've been to church. I've been coming to church. I've been paying my tithes. I've been giving an offering. I've been trying to help people out. So I know you're going to bless me. That means that you're putting God in debt. Saying that he owes you something. But if we look at this in terms of a cosmic scale, how much good can you do to outweigh the bad that you've done? It's impossible for you to uh, write the scales, even out the scales with your own human effort. 
The father knows that's impossible for you to write the scales. That's why he just said, here, take it. Just take it. Because I know you can't pay me back. You owe God trillions of dollars, trillions upon trillions upon trillions of dollars. And you finally, after years, have scraped up 20 cents. And you present your 20 cents to God and say, I know you're going to bless me now. Lord says, just take it. Just, just take it. But again, we, haven't, we have issues because we think that God is in our debt because we've done something good. Look at this. Look at what the Lord says here in Luke, the 17th chapter. Luke 17. And let's look at verses 7 uh, through 10. Again, out of the New Living Translation. Are you all sit with me? When a servant comes in from plowing or taking care of sheep, does his master say, come in and eat with me? No, he says, prepare my meal, put on your apron, and serve me while I eat. Then you can eat later. And does the master thank the servant for doing what he was told to do? Of course not. In the same way, listen, when you obey me, you should say, we are unworthy, or that is to say profitable, unprofitable. We are unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. He said, when you are obedient to me, when you do what is good, when you do what is right, don't expect me to bless you because you've simply done what you were supposed to do. You're not going to put God in debt. Now, you will have eternal, an eternal reward. Thank God for that. The Lord will say to you, I'm sure well done, you're good and faithful servant. I've got some stuff prepared for you. Hallelujah. But don't ever think that what you do uh, puts God in your debt because you've done so much more that he can't help but bless you. He only blesses you. He's good to you. He favors you because he loves you. And because God is good. Let that mindset be in you. Let this mind be in you. God is good. And he is good to you whether you do good or whether you do bad. He is good to you. Say, say with me, he is good to me. All right. Now, Christ fulfilled the requirements of the law. The law simply says those who... Do good will receive good, and those who do bad will receive bad. But the Lord came not only to fulfill the law, he came to fulfill or do away with that mindset, that religious mindset. Remember, the love of God or the grace of God or the goodness of God flows to you, number one, because he loves you, and number two, because he is good. All right. Now, let me show you some other things, too. Yeah, this is very important. When you, as a believer, sin, you're going to have to know how to deal with that, how to clean that up, how to deal with that. Because if you don't deal with it, the aftermath of this properly, you can, you can create inroads for the enemy in your life. Or footholds. You can give him footholds in your life. Now, let me explain some things to you. Exactly how the Lord explained this uh, to me. When you sin, the first thing you do, of course, you need to repent. You need to turn back to God. The next thing you need to do is confess your righteousness in Christ. Because the sin is what you did. That is not who you are. Confess your righteousness in Christ and then declare the goodness of the Lord. Expect God's goodness. Now, that's something that, again, that does not compute. I just sin. 
But you're telling me to expect God's goodness? That doesn't make sense, Pastor. I just sinned. I just fell short of the glory of God. And you're telling me that I should still expect God's goodness, that I should declare God is good to me. That's absolutely what I'm saying. Because at that point, at that moment, what the devil is trying to convince you of is that you're worthless. And he's trying to set in you shame. Uh, he's trying to uh, set up in you shame, doubt, guilt, defeat, unbelief. At that moment of sin, that's where he prowls. He set everything up so that you would do this so that he can get you to move from the foundation. Now, the foundation of Christ says God is good all the time and he loves me. And because of his love for me, he is good. He is good to me and his goodness flows. Regardless of my actions, whether I'm good or whether I'm bad, God loves me and he's good to me. Now, the enemy wants you to think, oh, you've done something bad, so you've now disqualified yourself from receiving God's goodness. So now you should expect to receive something bad. You've done bad. Now you should expect to receive something bad. Now there's a curse that's going to come on your life because you did this. So the enemy tries to bring in these door openers, these demonic door openers of shame and guilt and condemnation. And defeat and worry. Oh, what, what, look what I've done. He's attempting to turn your attention from Christ to yourself. And the moment you turn your attention from Christ to yourself, you have fallen from grace. Now you're more focused on what you did and no longer what he did. And the next step is to try to Bring yourself back in good favor with God. Well, let me go. I need to pray for a while now. I need to, I need to go back to church. I need to stop doing this, and I need, to, I need to stop doing that. What's happening? Trying to bring yourself back in good favor with God. Now, the problem with that is only Jesus can bring you in favor with God. And the moment you try to bring yourself back into proper fellowship with God and alignment with God, faith with God, now you're into self-righteousness. And your self-righteousness is as a filthy rag and is a stench in the nostrils of God. It doesn't work. And so because you know you can't do enough good, you're stuck in that cursed situation perpetually trying to do good so that God would love you, perpetually trying to do good so that he will bless you, perpetually trying to do good so that he will answer your prayers. You have fallen from grace. Now it's all about you and the work that you do. And now you have disqualified yourself. God didn't do it. You've disqualified yourself from receiving God's goodness. And now we're vulnerable, vulnerable to the gates of hell. We've stepped away. So what am I saying? What is the Lord saying? When you're good, expect to receive the goodness of the Lord. When you've done well, expect to receive the goodness of the Lord. When you've done sin or sin, done something bad, repent, turn back to the Lord, and expect to receive the goodness of the Lord. Be grace conscious, goodness conscious, and not sin conscious. Remember again that it is the goodness of the Lord that leads you into repentance. So if I focus on his goodness, I'm being led into repentance. But if I focus on the sin, I'm being led further into sin and away from the foundation. Are you understanding that? So it's important that you understand that at that moment of sin, your confession should not change. Before you've done something good or before you've done something bad, my confession is the same. The father loves me and I receive his goodness. I expect to receive his goodness every day. I expect to receive his goodness. Goodness and mercy are following me right now. I expect to receive the goodness of the Lord, the, the flowing river of God's goodness in my life. Right now, I receive his goodness. When I've done something good, I receive his goodness. After I've done something bad, I've repented. I still receive God's goodness because his goodness is not dependent upon me. And wherever you focus, that's where you're going to go. 
Whatever has your focus, that's what you turn to. That's the direction that you'll be going. So at the time of sin, if your focus changes to you, if it turns inwardly, if you begin to disqualify yourself, I'm not enough. Look at how I look. Look at what I did. Look, I can't believe I thought that way. I can't believe I said that. It's turned inward, inward. You're taking an inventory of yourself and you'll always come up short when you take an inventory of yourself. But at that moment of sin, if you would say, Father, I declare that I am your righteousness. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am in in Christ and I receive your goodness and your mercy in my life thank you father for forgiving me and now I get up and I focus on you and I thank you for what Jesus has done for me with his blood I don't have to requalify every time I've sinned I qualify based on the finished works of Jesus your relationship with God is not like your relationship with man it's not like your relationship with a spouse or with a friend you mess up with them. You say something bad or say something wrong and you hurt their feelings. And now you got to, oh, what I got to buy you now? Oh, I to, every time I see you, I got to keep on apologizing. I got to keep on apologizing to you like you never get over it. Come on. Come on. We dealt with this for months now. Uh, we, we, we're not back together yet. How much more do I have to do to get back in your favor? To get you to like me again, to get you, get you to go out with me again. How much more do I have to do? God is not like man. His goodness towards you is not dependent upon your goodness toward him. That's what you call unconditional love. His love is without conditions. Let's get the foundation right. So if we are of the mindset that if I do bad, I'm expecting bad to happen to me. I do something bad. And, oh, I know something's going to happen. I know something's going to happen. Or something happened during that day. And you, you automatically blame it. Oh, it's because I did this and God is punishing me now because of that. God is punishing me because I've been bad. God is punishing me. Now, God disciplines his children. He disciplines. He corrects us. Thank God he does. Or else we continue to go down a dark path, the wrong path, if, if he didn't straighten our path. But God does not send calamity your way because you've done something bad. Sin has its own penalties, its own trouble built into it. If you have a grenade and you pull that pin out, don't blame me if it explodes. It's going to explode. It has its own penalty. If you go around lying, you know, lying is a sin. You go around lying to everybody, it, you'll have your own trouble. You'll have your own trouble. You go around stealing things. Don't say God is punishing me because you've gone around stealing. So you're going to wind up in jail or somewhere even worse. You can't blame that on God. If you're married and you, and you go forth and commit adultery, you can't blame that on God. The results of all of that, you can't blame it on him. But through the goodness of the Lord, he will lead you to repentance. He will lead you back into right standing. He will lead you back into right fellowship with coworkers and friends and families through the goodness of God. But you don't have to requalify. And that's the problem. That's the thing. Now, please hear that. You don't have to seek to requalify with God every time you sin and fallen short. Because you didn't qualify yourself in the first place. So your sin does not disqualify you. And no, neither does your goodness qualify you to receive from the Lord. The Lord saved you because he loved you. And because he alone is good. You got that? So we need to move away from the religious mindset, from the, from the sin consciousness and come, and come forward to grace consciousness or the goodness conscience. Now, again, as we said, God's not giving you a license to sin. Well, if I sin, God's going to be still good to me. Well, why don't I just keep on sinning? Well, how much hell do you want in your life? 
How much do you want in your life? Because again, every sin comes along with its own consequences. You can't keep charging up your charge card, having fun charging up. Don't think there's, there's going to be consequences. Every time you swipe and you keep on swiping, you keep on swiping, and you keep on swiping, sooner or later the bill will come due. Keep on swiping that sin. Sooner or later, it's going to come due. Are you hearing? But don't be sin conscious. Be grace conscious. Be God's goodness conscious. Because again, the goodness of the Lord leads us into repentance. Leads us to the place where we can turn from that evil thing and turn back to God. Because you cannot do it without him. You cannot deliver yourself. I can't deliver you. You can't deliver me. Only the Lord can do this. Are you hearing? But please understand, you must remain on the foundation of Christ, regardless of what you experience, regardless of what you feel. You must remain on the foundation of Christ, what Jesus did. Remember the Lord said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You must remain on the foundation of Christ. It's about what he did, not what you do. The moment you focus on what you do, you're going to step in doo-doo. Maybe that'll help you remember that. Are you hearing? It's about what he did. So again, when the enemy comes your way, I pray that you don't sin. But if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father. We don't stay in it. But what do you do? You immediately repent before God. Don't let that stay on you. I mean, if you really go out and step in a pile of poop, how long are you going to let it stay on you? Are you going to try to clean it up immediately? Get a water hose and immediately clean it up? Or are you going to walk around with it for a while? And everywhere you go, you're leaving the scent of it. You're tracking it. You're tracking it everywhere you go. Well, that's how it is spiritually when we sin. You may not smell it, but it is definitely smelled in the spirit. You're tracking it everywhere. You're, you're leaving the aroma. What? Clean it off immediately. Don't walk around with it. Get it off you immediately through repentance. Talk to God about it. Lord, I stepped in this again. And it's the same old pile I stepped in last time. God help me. The pile didn't move, but we keep stepping in the same old pile. I can't get nobody to talk to me online community. Same old pile in the same old place. Same old stank. But when you focus on the goodness of God, on the grace of God, he empowers you. Powers you to say, oh, mm -mm, no, I'm not stepping that today. He will lead you into repentance. He'll lead you out of that into the into the light. But if you keep focusing on yourself, what you did, and then we go, now we're depressed. Now we're upset. Now because we did it, we don't want to come to church anymore. Now because all this stuff is happening, uh, you know, I can't pray. Why pray? And all this, all these negative emotions and feelings come to you. Now God won't hear you pray anymore. Now God doesn't love you anymore. Now God's after you. Now he hates you. Now I'm just feeling cursed. I'm just cursed. I'm just cursed. I'm just cursed because I can't do enough. I'm just cursed. I'm cursed. Nothing's working for me. Why are we saying all that? Because our attention is not on God. Now it's on us. And now we're trying to requalify. If I can just do, maybe I need to go back to church. Let me requalify. Maybe I just maybe I need to start paying my tithes and giving my offerings. Trying to requalify. But something that you didn't qualify for in the first place. Salvation is a gift from God. Not of works. Least any man should boast. 
Now, again, because God is good to you when you're good or when you're bad. Again, it doesn't mean, hey, let's go out and party. Because in every, in every sin, there's a pile of poop. And you're going to step in it every single time. And every time you step in it, the flies will come around. The flies are demonic spirits. And they love the smell of it. And you will attract them into your life. You didn't clean it off in prayer. You kept walking around with it. And now you're wondering, why are all these flies around me? Why all these flies? Are, I can't stand these flies. I can't stand these flies. Why is all this happening to me? Because you're walking around with poop on your foot. You never did clean it off in prayer. Now we're wondering, all this stuff is going around. Why, why don't nobody want, want me to be around them anymore? Because you stank. And we try to requalify ourselves, requalify, requalify. Listen, at the time we do it, my God help us. I'm not, I don't care if you got the blunt in your fingers, fingertips. I don't care if the alcohol bottle is in your hand. I don't care if you woke up with somebody you didn't even know who they were or what, or what happened. However deep you want to go. When the euphoria wears off and you come back to yourself and you say, my God, what, what am I doing here? What have I done? Get your water hose and spray that mess off. Repent before God. Father, forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Wash me. Make me clean. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. Restore me. Repent, wash that off. Declare, it may take everything in you. You sit there on the side of the bed or you sit there in your jail cell. Every, you may take everything in you to declare, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. God is good. He is good to me. I receive his goodness. I receive his goodness. What happens? The Lord grants you repentance. Only then he grants you repentance. And you continue to stand on the foundation of Christ. And those other doors that were open before, shame, guilt, condemnation, all those doors remain shut. And that doesn't enter into your heart and into your life. Does that make sense? Focus on Christ. Let's hold it right there today. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And Father, we ask you to forgive us for being sin conscious, for thinking that our sin was more powerful than the blood of Jesus, for thinking that our sin was stronger than your grace, for thinking that our bad would outweigh your good. Forgive us, Lord, for letting shame and guilt and condemnation in the door. Forgive us, Lord, for being law for being law conscious and not grace conscious. Lord, we ask you to wash all of that out of our hearts. Wash the shame and the guilt and the condemnation and worry out of our hearts. We repent. We repent. And we ask you, Father, even right now, to create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit on the inside of us we thank you Lord for your goodness and at this moment we declare that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and we receive your goodness every day we receive your goodness we receive it even right now the goodness of the Lord is pursuing me is pursuing us even at this very moment we receive the goodness of the Lord Help us, Father, to continue on the foundation of Christ. 
and never to step off of it. We thank you, Father. Bless your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Give Lord a mighty hand of praise. Hallelujah.